broker team. Today I've been requested to perform a respiratory examination on our patient, Ms. Matila. So, as with any examination, we start off with professional communication and approach. So, Ms. Matila, I'm Ash Pranjan, I'm a third year medical student, and today I've been requested to perform a respiratory examination on you. So, what I need to do is, I would, you know, I would assess your, uh, I need to assess your chest, and just to see if there are any problems. Can I have your consent to do this? Everything is confidential to just between us. Um, for, this, for the purpose of these videos, we will not expose this patient's chest or um, to privacy, but we will show you the procedure of how to perform the examination. Um, thereafter, we proceed to assessing to, uh, to, um, to stating our setting and preparation. I will ensure that the patient is in a comfortable, while it's private environment, the patient has a chaperone if she requests so. The patient could be at a, normally be at a 45 um, degree angle lying um, on her back. Um, I would make sure that my hands have been cleaned, have been warmed, and uh, and I would be wearing gloves if necessary. Thereafter, we proceed to the general examination proper. As with any general examination, we ensure that we start with proper inspection. First of all, we're looking for the patient's level of consciousness. The patient is comfortable, cooperative. We examine the nutritional status of the patient. The patient is neither obese, neither is the patient emaciated or too thin. Um, and we assess um, it, whether the patient is in any respiratory distress. Respiratory distress is extremely important to note. It can be a, a critical finding. It may, it, it, when looking for respiratory distress, examine for any nasal flaring, use of the accessory muscles, such as the accessory spirit, respiratory muscles, such as the sternocleidomastoids, um, when you're doing inspiration. Uh, you look for any cyanosis, and you look for any indrawing of the intercostal muscles during inspiration. Yes. Um, be care on inspection, make sure to note uh, any uh, tachypnea as well, but we will get to that. Our breaths per minute. Usually it is 12 to 20 breaths uh, per minute. Thereafter, we proceed to examine the pulses. You can assess the patient's radial pulse, lateral to the flexor carpi radialis uh, tendon, um, assessing the pulse for regular or not, and you examine its rate. Yes. Thereafter, we examine the skin temperature. Just go, you, examine, you place your, the back of your hand against the patient's skin, moving all the way up the arm, Towards the forehead. Examine skin turga for hydration. Just pinch the skin slightly and let it um, snap back. Then in, normal, norm, in, in normal cases, you will see this. In patients who are dehydrated, it will take longer for the skin to snap back to its original position. Thereafter, we move on to the fingers. Usually, I like starting with, the, with examining the nails first. This is a good point to observe capillary refill. The, the capillary refill in this patient is, is, is fast, and is, 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 is fast, it's quite rapid, you'd find this in normal patients. Then, you're going to examine the fingers, you're going to examine for any splinter hemorrhages, which is usually found in, in, in cases of trauma, um, or in, um, micro, in um, micro emboli that accumulate beneath the nail bed, you could find in vasculitis, or in all infected endocarditis. Um, Thereafter, we'd also make sure to look to uh, we look for uh, tobacco staining. You'll find this in you'll find this as a quite common feature in smokers. Thereafter, what we're going to do is we assess for clubbing. You assess for any hyperfluctuation of the nail bed. If not present in this patient, the patient does is, is negative shows negative signs of clubbing in that for that particular sign. You examine the nail bed from from the um, from a horizontal view, and you look for the obtuse angle between the nail bed and the skin ahead of it. In clubbing, you'll find a reduction in this obtuse angle. Now, Mr. Ntila, can you do this with your fingers for me, please? Now, you're going to look for the space in between both of the fingers known as Shamrock's window. If it is present, it's usually a sign that clubbing is not evident in this patient. Thank you, Mr. Ntila. Then, what we can also look for, you turn over the hand and you look for any signs of pallor. There's no signs of pallor in this patient. The skin is quite pink and well perfused. And well perfused. You look for any dupotrans contrixia, which is usually indicated, which is usually found in patients who consume a lot of alcohol. You'll find a very um, tense, flexed, uh, flexed wrist. Um, flexed wrist. Then, uh, Mr. Tila, can you do this for me, please? Thank you. What we would look for is flapping tremor in this patient, also known as asterixis. So, what you do is. You're going to push push back to extend the, the wrists a bit more, and then you're going to you're going to let go quickly and watch for for any flapping. Usually, you'll see something like this in cases of flapping tremor, which you find in respiratory failure. In respiratory, now moving up along the hands, we move to the head. Look for any abnormalities of the hairline, which is not present in this patient. Look for any temporal wasting, also not present in this patient. 
you look for the, you look at the face for any for its general symmetry look for any syndromic features such as in um, down syndrome the down syndrome you look for any you, you look for um, any any rashes so any such as characters such as the characteristic butterfly rash in SLE um, look for um, usually on cardiovascular examination as well you'll find what we call mitral fasces as well like I mean, it's a deep redness along along the the malar regions the, the malar regions of the face now we're going to examine the eyes Ms. Suntila, can you look up for me, please? It might be a bit uncomfortable. So we're looking for conjunctivitis and pallor. It's not present in this patient. Look down for me, please, Ms. Suntila. Looking for jaundice. Jaundice is not present in this patient. Also look at the center of the eye. Pala. Um, you can look for, you so look for jaundice. Um, you also look for arcosinolis as well. Uh, arcosinolis is like a deep, it's like a hazy blue ring around the eye. Usually found in elderly patients and is the result of lipid deposits. Look beneath the eyes as well for any xanthomata. Usually you'll find um, um, crusty lipid deposits beneath the eyes. Thereafter, we're going to examine the mouth. Look for any dryness of the mouth, any angular chelitis of the edges of the eye, the edges of the lips. May you, um, you open your mouth for me, Ms. Nutila, please? Look, for, look at the teeth for any dental caries. Look at the gums for any gingivitis. Uh, can you say R for me, please? Uh -huh. Look for any central cyanosis of the um, or pallor of the, um, of the tongue, which is not present in this patient. Also look for oral thrush, which is indicated by a, a fairly um, thick um, white, white layer along the, along the tongue. Then um, we would examine the back of the mouth. Um, you examine the uvula and um, the tonsils as well. It, look for pharyngitis if it's visible. Um, a, a good way, you remember to always use a proper light source for that part of the examination. Usually, um, if you don't have a torch, um, a, a smartphone, smartphone phones usually come with, um, with a, um, a, a built-in torch that can aid you with this part of the procedure. Um, you can thereafter proceed to examine the, the thyroid at this stage as well. So, you, um, Ms. Snotila, can you swallow for me, please? Make sure, try to see if you can visualize the thyroid, and you'll palpate the thyroid to see if there's any enlargement. We then proceed to examine the lymph nodes accordingly. So, um, usually what some of our consultants like to do is, is uh, Ms. Notila, can you please uh, stand, uh, sit up for me, please? You ask the patient to sit up, and may you just put your legs, swing your legs over there, please. Thank you. Always remember to stand behind the patient um, during this procedure. So, what you're going to do is assess the lymph nodes at the front first. So, you're looking for submandibular lymph nodes. Submental, beneath the chin, the anterior triangle along the neck. You're going to search for the supraclavicular nodes. Ms. Um, Sontila, can you please um, turn your head to the uh, left slightly, please? Thank you so much. This allows you to feel for any enlargement of Virchow's node, the left supraclavicular node, to feel for Trozier's sign. Then I would move to the front of the patient and examine the lymph nodes at the back. So, you'd examine the suboccipital, suboccipital, and the, the posterior triangle. At this stage, it's also very important to examine the axillary lymph nodes. Remember to use the right hand to examine the axilla um, on the left side of the patient. So what you're going to do is, um, Mr. Taylor, please, can you raise your, your arm for me, please? Thank you so much. What you do is, you'd, you'd, you'd place your, 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 your fingers within the axilla, you push forward, feel for the, um, for the uh, anterior axillary lymph nodes, push inwards for the medial, push backwards for the posterior, and upwards or apical. You'd remember to do that on the other side as well to compare. Um, the epitrochlear node is important as well. If you can feel it around here, make sure the patient's arm is relaxed. Compare on the other side. There are other lymph nodes you can examine as well, such as the, for the um, femoral lymph node, the inguinal lymph nodes, um, the popliteal lymph nodes as well. Yes. Um, so that's, our, and remember as well, please, you can lie down again, Ms. Notila. Thank you so much. Remember as well to move down to the uh, move down to the legs afterwards. So you test for calf tenderness. We'll always watch, watch the patient's face to see if you've elicited any pain. Um, um, you, there's a good opportunity to, to assess the popliteal pulses as well at this stage. Um, Tepitting edema, what you do is use your thumb, apply a bit of pressure to the uh, anterior tibia, usually wait a few seconds, and then if there's any depression of the skin, um, if the depression of the skin, see if there's any pitting. So if, the, if there's a depression um, um, around that area and it lasts for uh, longer than usual. Um, you can also feel the tussalis pedis pulse as well at this stage. Yeah, the, patient would be, uh, the patient's foot would be exposed at this stage. Make sure it's just for cyanosis, pallor, and clubbing of the toes as well. Now this is the important part. We're starting with the respiratory examination proper. As with any respiratory examination, 
we start off with upper inspection. Now we've just finished off with the general examination. So the chest would be properly exposed at this stage. Um, you stand at the foot of the bed and look for any, if look for the, uh, um, for, for adequate chest rise, you look for um, the, side, the symmetry of the chest, um, um, any, um, any visible pulsations, um, you look for scars, uh, distended veins as well. Make sure, uh, as I mentioned, yes, we, it's, it's important to identify this chest shape. Um, thereafter, what we're going to do is we start with palpation. With palpation, I, what I like to do is start with chest, um, with chest for chest expansion. So what you would do is you would place both of your hands on either side of the patient's chest wall chest wall, um, with, with your thumbs just slightly above the chest wall, not touching. Um, and then I'm going to ask Mr. Natila, can you breathe in deeply for me, please? Breathe out. Now you, you assess the, the distance that your finger, that your thumbs are moved away from each other, from the original position. And you see, we see that there is, this patient has symmetrical, um, equal um, chest expansion. Um, may you sit up for me, please, Mr. Natila? Thank you. Now you can also do that in the anterior posterior diameter, anterior posterior diameter. Can you breathe in deeply for me, Ms. Srotila? Breathe out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please lie down. We see chest expansion is also equal anteriorly and posteriorly. Okay. Now, what we're going to move on to then is to assess the trachea. So, Mr. so what you will do is, Ms. Srotila, this might be a bit uncomfortable, but I'm going to just put my finger here to see if you're, you're to, to feel, try to see if I can feel your trachea. Okay. So you just feel for the trick, yeah? No, try to note any deviation if possible. Can you breathe in for me deeply, please, Mrs. Matila? Thank you, breathe out. Now, what we, that test was for is known as, is was for to assess tracheal tug. It's important to note that when you, that when the patient breathes in deeply and they have a, a hyper expanded chest, um, you'll find that you'll feel the trachea pulling downwards. That is known as tracheal tug. Thereafter, you move to assess, you, you're going to assess for subcutaneous uh, emphysema and uh, tenderness all along the chest wall. Just if you, if you feel sub, subcutaneous emphysema is much like feeling for Velcro, feeling um, feel the sensation of feeling Velcro with your fingers. Then you assess the apex beat, try to localize it, feel with your, your fingers, and then, um, and then you'd, you'd mark, mark off your fingers, the intercostal spaces, move all the way down, until you get to, um, to, um, to the position where you feel the, the apex beat, and usually it is in the fifth intercostal space in the mid-clavicular line. Oh yes, um, before, um, before I conclude, it's important to note um, vocal frame, tactile vocal fremesis as well. Now, tactile vocal fremesis is important because it indicates the extent to which sound is conducted through the patient's chest wall and through your hands. It's usually a significant um, test when assessing for consolidation in lobe pneumonia. So now, um, Mr. Matila, I'm going to put my hand here on your chest and just say um, uh, um, uh, uh, one, one, one for me, please. One, one, one. Again. One, one, one. 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 Thank you. So that was to assess for tactile vocal parameters. Next of all, we're going to move to percussion. Percussion is an important aspect of any examination involving the chest wall and the abdomen. Um, for the respiratory examination, what you do is um, you start to direct percussion over the clavicle. Compare on the other side as well. Then what you do is you, um, we're going to assess. Um, we're going to assess. We're going to percuss along the chest wall um, on either side of the midline to uh, to compare accordingly. Describe the sound you hear. In this case, it's resonant. 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 Getting a bit dull. Usually on this side, usually around the area of the, the heart, you find what we call um, cardiac, uh, cardiac dullness. Make sure to elicit that. And it's dull here as well, which is a sign of liver dullness. Um, remember to repeat this process on the back of the, on the patient's back as well. Yes. So thereafter, um, we will move on to auscultation. Now, this is one of the most valuable parts of this examination because it will allow you to identify any breath sounds, any abnormal breath sounds um, that 
could indicate potential pathology. And it's useful to revise the view of various breath sounds and, it's, and there are the patterns associated with, um, with them and the related pathologies. So, first of all, what we do is we start off by listening over the, um, the supraclavicular fossa with the bell of the stethoscope. And, and whenever you put the, the stethoscope on the, on the patient, you're going to ask them to breathe in deeply and then breathe out. Can you do that for me, Mr. Notila? Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. So make sure you're going to describe, um, whenever you do this with a patient, when you describe the breath sounds according to quality of air entry, you decide the, describe the type of breath sounds you hear. In normal breath sounds, it's called vesicular breathing. And you assess, you try to hear if any breath sounds like wheezes, evidence of strider. Um, and there are, there, the number of breath sounds you can hear is numerous. Then you're going to use the diaphragm of the stethoscope and listen equally over the chest wall. Breathe in for me deeply, please. Breathe out. Again. Thank you. And you would repeat this process on the back of the patient as well. Now we move to what we call vocal resonance. Vocal resonance is a good indication of the extent to which these, the, the note, the note stated by the patient, the note, the note or a sound um, is transmitted to, through the, um, the chest wall. Also useful in cases of, um, also useful to tell if you have any consolidation, so pneumonia, or if there's reduced transmission of breath sounds, like in the case of an effusion or um, a hyper expanded um, lung. Uh, can you say a one 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 for me, please, Mr. Tila? Uh, again, we use the the bell for the uh, for the uh, supraclavicular fossa. One one one, one one one. So it's still resonant. You can still clear audible sound, equal on both sides. Okay. Mm -hmm. One one one. Mm -hmm. One one one. 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 One, one, one. Mm, thank you. And make sure to compare the sounds accordingly. Um, remember to repeat this process on the back of the patient um, and conclude your examination. So, so to conclude again, we've examined, we've inspected the, pa the patient, we performed a general examination on them, we've, um, we've um, palpated, percussed and auscultated um, throughout the chest and the back as well to examine if it takes uh, identify any um, any abnormalities in the patient's breathing patterns um, and we've expected the chest wall to see if there were any, uh, any other abnormalities that were significant um, but none are present in this in this um, in this in this patient Mr. Tila. I'm going to conclude your findings to the examiner, thank the patient and conclude them appropriately. Broker, better speakers, better doctors. Mm -hmm.